Hello, my name is Michael Seidman. I am an otorhinolaryngologist, head and neck surgeon, which is the fancy name for an ear, nose, and throat surgeon. I understand that you are considering having tubes placed in either yourself or your child. There are two primary reasons that we place pressure equalizing tubes into the middle ear space. Number one is for recurrent ear infections, and number two is for fluid that has persisted in the middle ear for too long, i.e. more than three or four months with a persistent hearing loss. In general, I follow guidelines set up by the American Academy of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgeons. And those guidelines state that if you've had four to six ear infections within the past year, you are a candidate for pressure equalizing tubes. The other primary indication that I alluded to already is that of persistent fluid. Originally, we stated if you've had fluid for about three or four months, you were a candidate to have pressure equalizing tubes placed. Now the guidelines have pushed that back to approximately five or six months, again, with a hearing loss. Why is it that people get recurrent ear infections, and why is it that kids get a lot of problems with fluids, uh, fluid in the middle ear? I'd like to refer to this diagram here that you can see. Now, there's a couple of problems that we have to first realize. And if you close up and look in this area here, you can see that this is the outer part of your ear or the external ear, which makes up the outer ear and the ear canal. The middle ear starts on the inside surface of the eardrum. This is the eardrum right here. You can see that. And then the inside surface starts the middle ear space, which is normally an air-containing space, which consists of the three smallest bones in your body the malleus, the incus, and the stapes, also called the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup. The middle ear is then connected to the back of the nose via the eustachian tube, or the eustachian tube. It's interesting in that every time we swallow, open or close our mouth, or yawn, the eustachian tube opens and closes and allows the middle ear space to become aerated or pressure equalized. That's why these tubes are also called ventilation tubes or pressure equalizing tubes. The other problem that we have, particularly in children, is this right here. You can see this different setup here. In adults, the angle of the eustachian tube from the middle ear space to the back of the nose sits at approximately a 40 to 45 degree angle. In a small child, it sits at approximately a 10 degree angle. And this changes as they grow. And roughly between the ages of 4 to 6 or 5 to 7, it achieves an adult position of a 45 degree angle. The other primary problem with kids is that the isthmus of the eustachian tube, which is this spot right here, is the narrowest spot of the eustachian tube. In an adult, it is approximately 1 millimeter in diameter. So you can imagine how small it is in a child. Now, every time we swallow or open or close our mouth or yawn, this opens and closes and equalizes the pressure in the middle ear space. If you have a cold, just like your nose gets stuffed up, so does the lining in the eustachian tube. And when that lining gets stuffed up, if you can imagine, again, only being a millimeter in diameter, it swells and blocks this area here. If this area becomes blocked, what then happens is you have air trapped in the middle ear space with no place to go. Over time, the cells that are lining the middle ear space suck that air out, and they cause it to be a negative pressure inside the middle ear, which gives us a retracted, gives us a retracted um, eardrum. And that's what we see when we do a tympanogram or a pressure test from the audiogram. So this eardrum gets sucked inward. If you build up enough negative pressure inside the middle ear space, fluid then flows out from the cells inside here, and then you get fluid inside the middle ear space. Lastly, that fluid can get infected, and those are some of the stages that go along when getting acute suppurative otitis media or an acute ear infection. That process of going from a blocked eustachian tube to negative pressure to a retracted eardrum to fluid in the middle ear space to an actual active infection can occur within two hours. So it's a very quick process. The idea of ventilation tubes or pressure equalizing tubes, if we can go back close up to this area here for just a moment, you'll see that the tube actually goes right into the eardrum. And there is a flange on either side. So one flange sits in the middle ear space, one flange sits in the external ear. And then there's a small hole inside, and that hole allows you to ventilate the middle ear space. So it essentially bypasses the eustachian tube that is not working well in your child or yourself if you are having this done. Okay, now, 
what are the risks and complications of pressure equalizing tubes? Although we say that they are very helpful for people who have these recurrent ear infections or fluid, there are definitely risks that you have to be aware of. The primary risks are bleeding, okay? We make a small nick in the eardrum and just like the rest of the body, it, it bleeds a little bit. And if a little bit of blood gets inside that tube, it blocks it off. So then you're back to square one, if you will. Infection is another risk. We're doing this for infection, so the idea is to reduce the number of infections. And typically, if you've had six, seven, eight, ten infections in a year's time, you will typically go down to having zero, one, or two. There are some children who get chronic drainage from their ear because of the tubes being in place. They say that that occurs in up to 30% of patients. In my practice, in my experience, I see it about one out of 100 times. Even so, parents are usually happier about that because typically we can treat that with ear drops that are antibiotic and medicated rather than oral antibiotics. Besides bleeding and infection, you can have some blockage of the tube, as we've mentioned, and then the tube becomes non-functional. That's unusual, but it does happen. We can have some scarring of the eardrum, but you can also get scarring of the eardrum from recurrent ear infections. And even people who have a significant amount of scarring usually do not have a drop in their hearing unless it's extremely severe, which is rarely seen. The two scariest risks, in my opinion, of pressure equalizing tubes are after the tube falls out, the eardrum typically heals. But if it does not, you can have a perforation. Now, the literature states that about 5 out of 100, or roughly 5% of people, have a perforation with a tube in place. In my experience, it's about 0.05. Roughly 2 out of 1,000 patients, in my experience, have had problems with perforation. So I think that it is fairly rare. The scariest uh, complication that can be associated with tubes if this is a child that needs anesthesia is that of anesthesia. Now, the risks of anesthesia are very few and far in between, but they certainly can occur. And the scariest risk is, of course, um, not W-A-K-E-ing -E up. I spell that uh, in case there's any children watching. Um, the likelihood of that happening uh, in a JAMA study, that's the uh, Journal of the American Medical Association, uh, several years ago reported that it is now down to approximately five out of a million. So it's extremely unlikely. Now what happens if you leave fluid in for too long? Well, you can get speech and language delays and your child may not be speaking well. Even though it's a subtle hearing loss, it's enough that most parents say, well, I think my child is hearing okay, but some will tell me, yeah, I think he's not responding so well and I'm not sure if it's the age and those types of concerns. But some parents do say that they're not speaking as well or they're concerned about that. And even though the hearing loss is mild, it can indeed cause a problem with uh, speech difficulties. Now, what are the alternatives to tubes? Just because your child has seven or eight ear infections in a year's time does not mean that you have to have tubes for that child. It means that he is a candidate for tubes. The alternatives are to treat each infection as it comes or to put the child on maintenance antibiotics. With fluid, we pretty much do the same thing. We put them on long-term antibiotics. There have been studies done where when children were going to sleep for tubes in the ear, they passed the needle into the eardrum sucked out the fluid and sent it for culture. And approximately one third, that is roughly 33 out of 100, grew out bacteria. And that's why we treat people who have fluid in the ear with antibiotics. We think it may help. But essentially, if you think about it, we're over-treating two thirds of the population. Uh, it's because most parents, and, and me being one of them, would not like their child subjected to a needle in their ear, so we over-treat in those situations. Uh, but fluid is a problem, and fluid causes hearing loss, so we need to do something about it. Besides the antibiotics, you can consider decongestants, antihistamines, and steroids. However, all of the literature has shown that there is probably, uh, that they probably have no effect. Now, on one hand, it doesn't seem to make much sense to me because I feel that if you can decongest the eustachian tube, it ought to help. But some people are concerned that the de decongestants remove the thin part of the fluid, leaving you only with the gluey substance behind, giving you a glue ear in the middle ear space, which will never come out unless you suction it out. So it's very controversial, but most people feel that there is not a significant benefit uh, of that. Now, what about allergy considerations? If your child is allergic to milk or environmental allergies, those sorts of things. Most allergists feel that they do not have a significant role in ear infections. There was a study, study from Georgetown University which showed that there probably was an association. And I personally believe from the parents and the children that I see that there may be an association that's extremely difficult to prove. Lastly, I want to mention alternative therapies because I've had a couple of parents who have taken their kids to chiropractors or acupuncturists who have said that they can manipulate the bones and maybe have the eustachian tubes open up. Um, 
I am the last person to ever criticize non-traditional Western uh, methods, and I think that we need to keep an open mind, but there is no scientific proof that that works. Now, I certainly don't have a problem with you trying that. If you do it within a reasonable amount of time, I do not want your child or yourself to have speech or language difficulties if there is a problem with fluid. If you decide that you're ready to have pressure e equalizing tubes, what can you expect? First of all, about a week before, the anesthesiologist or the nurse uh, at the operating room will want to see you or your child um, and examine them. And they may or may not obtain some blood work. The day before surgery, you cannot have anything to eat or drink after midnight. Um, however, if you have a very small child, they may have you wake them up in the middle of the night to have something more to drink. Uh, but this is up to the anesthesiologist, and I don't want you doing that unless you talk to them specifically about that. You will typically be asked to come about one and a half to two hours prior to the actual surgical uh, uh, time that is scheduled. And when you arrive, they'll take all the necessary information. They'll give your child or you uh, a sedative. Um, if, we, if it's an adult, we do this up in the office, and I use some numbing medicine on the ear. It hurts for just a second, and that's about it. Um, once they've decided whether they're going to start an IV or not. They then leave the pre-op area and go to the operating room. Then they hook on necessary monitors so your child's not asleep at that point. So it takes about 10 minutes to hook up all the appropriate monitors. Then the child is uh, made to fall asleep. Then I go ahead and I make a small nick in the eardrum. I suction out the fluid. I place the tube in. And then I put the antibiotic drops in. So I'm putting in the first set of drops. Once we're all done with both sides, uh, the child is then woken up from anesthesia, returned to the recovery room, monitored there by nurses intensively, and then I come out and talk to you once I know that your child is doing perfectly fine. And they do not usually like you to come back into the room until the child is starting to wake up, um, because sometimes they found that parents uh, inadvertently wake up their children, uh, and we want them to rest so that they wake up as naturally as possible. Um, after surgery, there is no pain from the tubes. I ask that you place three drops of the antibiotic drop into each ear three times a day for three total days. That reduces the likelihood of any blood clotting inside the tube. Now, if you get an ear infection, which would be manifest by drainage from the ear, I then ask that you use the same drops, three drops, three times a day. But instead of for three days, I ask that you use them for seven to 10 days. That way, you're getting a full antibiotic course of ear drops in the ear. Now, I can tell you that if you see any of your other doctors, they'll oftentimes put you on an oral antibiotic. Nine and a half out of ten times, you don't need it. The eardrops are enough. On rare occasion, if the drainage doesn't stop, I ask that you bring your child in to see me, and I will suction that fluid out, and probably then the drops will get in better. The way I ask you to put drops in is to first warm them up in your hands, because it makes it a bit more tolerable for the child. You can put them in some tepid water for approximately 10 or 15 minutes, if you wish as well. You don't want to boil them. That's not good. It may deactivate the medication. You then put the drops inside the ear, and you push on this part of your ear. This is called the tracheus, and sort of pump it in gently. Often with smaller kids, you have to pretty much pin them down on the floor. They're not too happy about having this done. You can try to make it a game um, as best as you can. I ask that you leave the drops in for about a minute or two, and then turn them to the other side and place them uh, in the other ear. Let the excess come right out of the other ear. That's exactly what I would like to happen. Now, the tubes typically stay in place for 6 to 12 months. I have seen them fall out at 2 to 5 days. I've seen them still in place after 7 to 10 years. Both of those extremes are highly unusual. And again, the average is about 6 to 12 months. There are also many different types of tubes. One other one that I want to mention is a T-tube, because some other people use those. Those tubes frequently stay in forever, and you have to remove them. The only reason I personally don't like them is I found that any of the patients, I've had a total of five out of more than 3,000 uh, pressure equalizing tubes that I've placed. Um, I've had uh, most of my perforations with the T-tube, so I prefer not to use them unless your child, for example, has a cleft lip or a cleft palate, which would predispose them to needing tubes for a longer period of time. Now, you say, when will my child outgrow this? I put tubes in some 90-year-old people, so you don't necessarily outgrow this, but most kids will outgrow this by the time they're four to six years of age. I am frequently asked if I'll be removing the adenoid tissue. Um, the adenoid tissue sits way in the back of the nose, and it can block where the eustachian tubes drain. Now, I typically do not remove them the first time. If I am placing tubes for a second or a third time, I will always remove the adenoids. Or if you can tell me that your child or you have a snoring problem or a mouth breathing problem, I will remove them the first time. What I have found is that out of 100 people that I place pressure equalizing tubes in, only 20 need a second set of tubes. So if I did adenoidectomy the first time on everybody, in my opinion, I'd be doing 80 unnecessary adenoidectomies, and I don't believe in doing that. So the second time, if your child is in that 20% group, I will go ahead and do that. Now, 
Um, I have been the unfortunate uh, uh, situation that I have three children, that's the good situation, but my third child has had three sets of tubes. Uh, so I've been in the unlucky 20% and he's had his adenoids out and he's still had the problem. So it doesn't cure everybody. It's not a guarantee if we take out the adenoids that they aren't going to have further problems. Um, after the surgery is completed, I see all of my patients back within about six weeks just to make sure the tubes are in perfect position. And then I see my kids or my adults every six months until the tubes are out and the eardrums are healed. If there was a hearing loss before surgery, I do ask that we get a hearing test afterwards just to document that the hearing has improved. Lastly, I want to mention about water precautions. If you ask 10 otolaryngologists, eight tell you no water. You got to wear earplugs or you can't swim. There have been several studies done now which have taken 50 people and put tubes inside their ear. And 25, they said strict water precautions. You're not allowed to swim. You're not allowed to get your ears wet. Don't shower. Don't bathe. I'm being a little facetious. And 25, they said, go ahead and swim in lakes, ponds, wherever you like. The 25 who were swimming in lakes and ponds had one or two less ear infections than the 25 who were doing strict water precautions. So in my experience, it probably doesn't matter. Now, every time I say that there is one child out of 100 who any time that child goes near the water, within 12 to 24 hours, that child has pus draining out of their ear. And I tell that parent, your child cannot swim, your child cannot get the ears wet. We can make earplugs for you, or you can try the over-the-counter uh, type of earplugs, whatever works well. But again, I don't generally recommend um, water precautions for the majority of my patients. But I am in the minority, and if you wish to wear earplugs, you certainly may. Um, I want to thank you very much for taking the time to watch this tape, um, and I am going to be here to answer some more questions for you. Thank you.